was really something new, and this is really underappreciated. I write about this in my book. In 1970, mega churches, defined as fundamentalist churches, 2,000 or more on an average Sunday, there were fewer than 100 of those in 1970 in the United States of America. Now there are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of these churches, as you know, many are also in Canada as well. It is a transformed society, and the mega church movement played a critical role in this major change in American society. And with that, while they were building these vast churches, they also were smart. They started out smart and they started out small. They would work their ways into the school boards, into the parent-teacher associations, into the local governments, until they rose their way up, until they had veto power over one of two major political parties in the most powerful nation on earth. I document in my book 10 areas of American public policy with religious bias. I'm not talking about areas of bias in, in social matters or individual attitudes. I'm talking about religious bias in American public policy. And I'm not talking about religious bias in terms of things like opening a town meeting with a prayer or, or a cross on public land. Those can be important symbolic issues. No. In my ten areas of law, I'm talking about documented areas where there are victims. People who are harmed by religious bias in American public policy today and many examples in each of the ten areas of American law. So when people say, oh, watch out for the specter of theocracy in this country, yes, I don't think America is a theocracy now, but theocracy has been rising and largely successful in a way that most people, including most secular people, are not even aware. So it is an important historic change. But I also want to say that they are not done. They are continuing to work very effectively. And that fundamentalism is an export business of the United States of America. You know, many of you in this room have heard about the horrible injustices in Uganda, but some of you might not know that fundamentalist Protestant churches in the United States in particular worked, funded, organized in Uganda to support some of the most heinous and terrifying laws in the entire world in 2013, coming from the United States of America. And what might be counterintuitive is that you also see in the developed world, the rise of fundamentalism in a way that we might not expect. I recently returned from a speaking tour in uh, New Zealand. And you might consider New Zealand oh, a wonderful secular uh, paradise. But I want you to consider that in New Zealand they have special religious education in their taxpayer funded schools and that the majority Christian viewpoint is taught. And I want you to picture a child in these New Zealand schools who is sent literally, documented cases, that sent to the naughty corner because they happen to be, I don't know, Hindu or not religious or a Jew. Now, these children, told to pick up trash because they happen to not be in the majority viewpoint, the reason, the reason for secular education is to unite a civic society in striving not to divide us in rancor. In these government schools, though, it's either accept the majority Christian view or be segregate, segregated and denied education while you are segregated. And it is often the growing movement of fundamentalists in that country who volunteer to be the educators in these religious instruction courses, even when the majority of the Christian parents who are allowing their kids to be in these classes are not fundamentalists themselves. It's the fundamentalists who are staffing, via volunteers, this religious education. In another perceived secular paradise, the nation of Australia, I was honored to speak at the Sydney Opera House a few weeks ago. And in Australia, we see a similar and perhaps more ominous trend that we see in New Zealand. Increasingly, since the 1990s, fundamentalist schools in Australia are getting government money. Some allegedly private religious schools get a higher percentage of their money from the Australian government than do so-called government schools. There's a school called Bible Baptist Christian. They get 86% of their funding from the Australian government while they teach the earth was created in 624-hour days. They teach children about the reality of the damnation of hell, which they must fear. They teach the accelerated Christian education curriculum, which I know is 
uh, originates in the southern U.S., but I know is taught also in religious schools in Canada as well. If you're not familiar with that curriculum, it is scary. Not just on religious issues. They teach some of the most right-wing, vile things about the Civil War and about race. It's astounding, and they have that there in some of these schools in Australia. Almost 40% of Australian secondary school students attend non-government schools, so-called non-government schools, even though they often get government money. Almost 90% of that group are Christian schools, and the increasing percentage is fundamentalist schools. So, now let's consider America's greatest trading partner, where, unfortunately, fundamentalism is also an expert. The Prime Minister, of Canada belongs to the Christian and Missionary Alliance, a fundamentalist church that believes their version of the free market is somehow divinely inspired and that non-believers are lost. This denomination also believes that Christ's return is, quote, eminent. I don't know what that means. Check your watches. I'm not really sure. About that. <laughs> but you might say, or even I might at first say, well, that's a private matter. It's none of my business what his private religion is. And, and in fact, that would be my initial instinct to, to say that. But under Prime Minister Harper, science doesn't just take a back seat in church. It takes a back seat in government as well. Restricting government, Canadian government scientists, from telling the truth and answers to reporters' questions. While churches in Canada don't even need to bother to reveal the truth regarding their tax status and eligibility. Unlike other charities, churches are not required under Canadian tax law to demonstrate any community service whatsoever. Under Harper, scientists that you pay taxpayer money for have to get clearance from Harper's administration to answer often very basic scientific questions to issues that you funded. A prominent Canadian science journalist said that this is, quote, sort of like asking the White House for permission to tell about scientific facts. Now, this sounds more to me like something we hear about the George W. Bush administration than what I understand to be the spirit of what Canada is really about. And yet we have Gary Goodyear, Minister of Science and Technology for the Harper government. He was asked about evolution. His response was, and I quote, I am a Christian and I don't think anybody asking a question about my religion is appropriate, close quote. The Harper administration imposed cuts on the Canadian Genome Project while religious universities got increased in funding, including schools that discriminate based on sexual orientation here in the nation of Canada. And in secondary and elementary education, religious schools in many provinces receive direct government money, as most of you know. Increasingly, however, that money is going to fundamentalist schools, both fundamentalist Protestant schools and Islamic schools that include fundamentalist teaching. And even the long-standing government-funded Catholic schools organized children at a government-funded school to protest against a woman's right to choose. Harper's public safety uh, minister was vocal in opposition to hate crimes legislation because he said it would restrict religious expression. What kind of expression is that? He said that homosexual activists could sue a hotel chain to claim, to, to claim so that they could remove Bibles as hate literature, which is nonsense. It's a specter. It's right-wing talk, not reality. This same Harper minister strongly opposed same-sex marriage, saying it could result in legalizing polygamy. These are the kind of ad, ad, uh, attitudes that we see in this administration. Many predict that a conservative religious politician will win election to the Prime Ministership of Australia in September 2013. I hope that does not come to pass, but there is a valid fear that Stephen Harper is not an anomaly, but a trend. Mm -hmm. And this has international implications for everyone. Harper eliminated Canada's G8 foreign aid funding for abortion. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird said, and I quote, we don't see agnosticism or atheism as being in need of defense in the same ways as religious minorities in other countries. Well, Foreign Minister Baird, he can tell that to the young man I learned about through the Dawkins Facebook page in Bangladesh who committed a crime, and it is a crime in the country of Bangladesh, he committed the crime of criticizing Islam in a blog that he typed on a laptop. So the foreign minister could say that to this young man. He, the foreign minister could express his opinion to that young man, except that that young man was chopped to pieces with a machete in 2013 for his opinion. Chopped to pieces 
with a machete in 2013. I asked for you to do a mind experiment about what it would like to be an American in the 1960s and what you thought the status of the religious right was in the American country in 1966, 67. What was it like there? And they thought, no problem, no worries about that. I asked my friends, people who are Canadian, Australian, New Zealanders, to look around you and remember what happened in America and to take action. The religious right does not have any magic powers, but the religious right has organized. They have been very effective, and we largely have not, and we owe it to ourselves. We owe it, more importantly, to the next generation to organize so that we can understand what's, I think, the most important thing. If the religious right can organize internationally for intolerance and injustice, then we can organize for reason and science and compassion. I began making a, a crack about being a lawyer, a lobbyist, and a legislator, but you know, if they can have lawyers and lobbyists and legislators for the religious right movement, a movement of intolerance, then I think there are young people in this room who should become lawyers and lobbyists and politicians for justice and compassion. Our cause, the secular Whether or not you call yourself a humanist or an agnostic, we together can organize. Whether or not you think we should be strident or a street epistemologist, we together can organize. Whether we believe in that Bayes theorem's application to the history or not, we together can organize. And I don't know for sure whether or not I have free will, but I sure as hell am going to act like it. Yeah. Because <laughs> there is too much injustice in this world. There's too much injustice. And we need to act now. There are too many children suffering in this world because of religious bias in law and policy in the developing world, in the Arab world, in America. I want you to speak out for the human rights of children in the United States, which I document in my book are threatened by religious bias. We need your help. There are too many women, too many women being told by religious extremists and by religious laws what to wear, where to wear it, who they shall talk to, whether they shall drive, and whether or not they can live at all in 2013, all because of a religious motivation in places throughout the world, millions of women in that situation. We have to take action, because to me, my philosophy, my deepest philosophy is the one of James Madison's philosophy. It matters what happens in this world and what you are doing in this world, and in the political interactions in this world. We are judged by our actions. So when I say organize, when I say organize, I don't mean some nice abstraction that will make us feel good at the cocktail reception later. I mean you, and I mean today, and I mean for the rest of your life. I mean you having a historic impact. And in a more internationalized world, there is no reason that Canada cannot be a leader in an international, secular, human rights movement. The old national boundaries matter so much less in the internet world. Nations like Canada, New Zealand, Australia can be at the vanguard, because you have so many secular people, of a secular human rights movement worldwide. You know, I knew some folks who were Pakistani free thinkers, and these people were brave. They risked their lives to organize a Facebook page. And you might think, big deal, why organize a Facebook page? But they knew, they told me directly, that by being the prime administrators on a Facebook page, they were risking their life. And remember, some of you may know that the Richard Dawkins Foundation Facebook page was hacked. My personal uh, Facebook page was hacked. So these things happened. They were, my page was hacked by Muslim extremists, as was the foundation page. So these Pakistani free thinkers are risking their lives by putting together a Pakistani free thinkers page. And you know what happened? Muslim extremists bombarded Facebook uh, with negative reports against that page, and the Pakistani free thinkers page was shut down by Facebook based on negative reports. 
We put together a petition at the Richard Dawkins Foundation Facebook page. Thousands of people, thousands of you signed on to that petition and somewhere in the gods of Facebook they uh, listened to our plea and they did restore the Pakistani Freethinker Facebook page. I want you to be involved with that. I want you to be leaders in an international human rights movement for secularism. My book is not a whether or not book about religion. There are many great books on that topic that I admire. My book is a how-to book. My book is a strategic planning book. My book is a specific action book. My book is a grow our movement book. My book is a book about you. It is a book about what we can do together for a secular world. Vigilant and activist at home and vigilant and activist abroad. Please consider these three specific steps. Specific action one. My book outlines this 10-point vision of a secular America, a list of injustices designed specifically to persuade your neighbors to act rather than sit back, designed to persuade the public when you are interviewed that this really matters, that this has a human impact. And in Australia, you know what they did? They took that American 10-point vision of a secular America and they wrote their own 10-point vision of a secular Australia, specific to them, written by them, about the laws and issues they face there on the ground. You can do the same thing in Canada. Offer the specific injustices up to your neighbors. Take the lead in fighting for human rights so that we can no longer be dismissed as, as you know, arguing about whether angels are dancing or not on the head of a pin. Give them specifics about how this harms our world to have religious bias. Specific action number two, organize free thought conventions in every province in Canada focused on Canadian issues and the Dawkins Foundation will help. We can't help with every time, you know, there's a uh, skeptics meeting at a pub, but if you're organizing a big event, a province-wide free thought convention, we will help make that happen. It is great when you have a Dan Dennett come to speak, when you have a Richard Dawkins come to speak, when there are these international speakers, it's wonderful. But what I think, what I think is critically important is that we have our local people, our farm teams, if you will, ready, who bubble up with people who are professors, people who are local elected officials, people who are local organizers and activists, so that when you hold your provincial-wide convention on free thought, we've got the people we need, the organization we need to have a civic impact on society around us. Specific action number three, as I mentioned earlier, take the lead in international secular human rights. I talked about the blogger in Bangladesh who was chopped to pieces with a machete this year because he said something against Islam. I posted about that on the Dawkins Foundation Facebook page and I saw reporters pick that up. So it got into more of the mainstream media, what is really happening. So send me secular human rights stories that we can publicize and get out to a broader world and people can understand how significant this issue is. You know, I am devoting my life to this cause. I have a passion for this issue and much of it springs from my experience back in the Maine legislature. Now Maine is not Alabama. It's not as extreme as other states of the Union that you might hear about. And yet I served 10 years in politics. I was six years on the Judiciary Committee which had jurisdiction over women's rights, had jurisdiction over marriage equality, had jurisdiction over children's issues. I served on the Appropriations Committee, the most powerful committee in the legislature, and then I was one of six in leadership. My point is I had reason to be lobbied. And you know who lobbied me? The religious right did. They lobbied everyone. They worked hard. They lobbied consistently. Every single day they were out there working and I respect their work effort. In 10 years in elective office, not once, not ever, did someone come to me and say, I represent a secular humanist viewpoint and I'm asking you to vote my way. That has to change. We have to change that. Because stuck in my craw when I was in politics. You sit on the Judiciary Committee, it's a horseshoe in my state, 13 politicians sit on the, on the horseshoe of the table and people come and testify before the committee. And when you're talking about women's rights, when you're talking about uh, marriage equality, issues like this, uh, the people on the religious right would get up and uh, they would have all this credibility there. They, and they would often use this word morality. 
They'd be using this word morality, and I could uh, understand very clearly what they meant, is that my position on these issues was somehow the immoral position. And frankly, everybody accepted the premise, including people on my side of the issue. They somehow accepted the premise that the word morality was owned by these other folks. And I think that is an injustice. I think that the word morality has been stolen from us, and we need to take the word morality back. <laughs> Their vision of what morality is, is, is a petty and a small vision. Whenever I saw what they meant by the word morality, it meant something to do with your, your naughty bits. Well, I don't care what you do with your naughty bits. It's none of my business. That's a little bit of main small town wisdom. None of my business is where we should be on those issues. No, when I was a kid, in my parents' time, my parents had leaders that they really uh, believed in. And they thought that there were giants who walked on this earth. One giant was five foot six, and his name was Martin Luther King. And another giant was five foot nine, and his name was Robert Kennedy. And those two men knew, by FBI reports, knew that they had more death threats against them than any other non-presidents in history. No protection. None. For years, they went out every day and spoke to people, and they spoke about morality. They spoke about morality, but what they meant by morality was those who were left out, those who were dispossessed, those who were left in the shadows. That's what morality means, and the secular humanist cause is the cause that can be the voice in this century for those values. That's what we need to do together. And I stand ready to work with you on the nitty-gritty details, the grassroots training efforts, the lobbying strategy sessions. That's what I care about. That's what I like to do. That's what I wrote about in my book. But as much as I love those things, I want to also take a moment now to celebrate the values that inspire us. Because that really is what I hope drives us all. Yugen is a Japanese word, meaning a profound, mysterious sense of the beauty of the universe. As wonderful as Yugen is, it is still not the most transcendent feeling our species can achieve. There's a greater challenge and a higher pleasure that can only be achieved by first facing the world as it is. In this world, a few feel chosen by God to strap on the explosives, pull the cord, or guide the plane that annihilates themselves and innocent people. In Baghdad, Pakistan, the towers. A few more feel chosen by God to machete the other guy, the free thought blogger in Bangladesh, shoot the secular politician in Tunisia, blow up the post office in Oklahoma City. Thousands more feel chosen by God to embrace so-called faith healing, placing a cookie tray under their daughter's infected leg as the pus drains out. No doctors, please. We're chosen by God to hurt our child and get politicians to pass laws that make it easier to do so. There are millions of very good, decent, honorable, religious people in the world, and yet it is also true that there are millions who feel chosen by God, worse yet are taught the so-called truth. The gay person is mutated. The woman shall be regulated. The child indoctrinated. God's alleged in-group, so certain, so lustful, for their holy law, actual laws, imposed on us all. Some laws from Mississippi to Maine, many laws from Cairo to Karachi. Meanwhile, my favorite God gets a pink slip, and I'm annoyed about this. You know, he gets my vote for best God, yay me, right? Come on, Mr. Bro. I think it's unjust because there's no laws in Odin's name now. You know, you gotta, you gotta pity them. You gotta pity poor old Apollo, Ishtar, Quetzalcoatl, shuffling their feet in the unemployment line with <laughs> Odin and Isis and Axel Rose. <laughs> but some of us, some of us doubt that fashionable gods are more credible than unfashionable gods. Instead, we turn to people. People who question Einstein, Voltaire, Jefferson, reason, science, that wind blows wicked cold, we are warned from the megachurch pulpit, from the mosques, from the U.S. House Science Committee. And yes, that wind 
does bite. Your call, says the doctor, turn off my mother's motherboard. Her hardware failed. Her software lit only by outside power. Pulling that plug, I saw no hearts, no wings. White, yes. Clinical white hospital walls. Bone white cremation papers. We are all on that very same life raft on which my mother sank. Our children, we hope, our parents, we hope, might be lucky with loved ones to talk to on that life raft. But that life raft is leaking, and there is no safe harbor. Facing this hard truth, reason and science lead us somewhere real and warm. More than 200,000 years of humans, only 400 years since Francis Bacon, Bacon's book, his treatise, The New Method, the rigorous scientific method. A mere 400 years ago, 400 years out of 200,000, we are just limbering up. No more opposite sides of some mythological line, gay versus straight, Muslim versus Hindu, myth versus judgmental myth. Reason and science is a thread. We draw ourselves forward on that thread. Before you face white hospital walls, you face a blank white canvas. <laughs> Paint, write, grow, bloom. So yes, love those children. Thank whoever's arm you can touch in bed. Yes, laugh. Yes, enjoy. Yes, be thankful. 200,000 years, we are here now. Revel in it, have fun. Human lifespan has been doubled. And we can make science fly. We can do things that can change the world. And now, it's not the old us versus them. Old tribe is so wrong. We have our new tribe. Darwin's evolutionary thread. Dawkins genetic thread. Now we know our thread runs way back to Cousin Bonobos, to fish. More family to me than some mega minister pounding his bully pulpit. <laughs> our new tribe views from space our globe entire. We use our brain, the best computer, creating the brightest colors. Van Gogh, the Sydney Opera House, the Apollo Mission, the Mayo Clinic, Abbey Road. What's next? Not the shadows, not the mythical cul-de-sac. Stand up, shoulders back in the sun. Whatever is you happens just once. So bring yourself all the way out. Art, science, politics, yes, politics. The politics of reason and science, of evidence and compassion. For no compassion is real, no compassion honest, unless we embrace evidence and modify our conclusions based on that evidence, always seeking compassion and progress. Organize, work hard, but we will make of our politics a party, the office party of reason and science, with drinks and making out with supply closets. <laughs> Stand up. Stand up for reason and science. Tradition and dogma are bullies. We pursue the newest methods, the strongest solutions, the boldest plans, and the highest ideals. And still always risk fun, because yes, it is scary. It is scary. This is our one and only performance. Beyond even Yugen is this best feeling. Accomplish something. Improve our world. That's our greatest possible joy. Unleashed from dogma, we dance a jig carefree along the cliff's edge of time. Proud of our dance is never hesitant, never cringing, offered boldly, honestly, joyfully, completely. So dig in. Dig into the work, the nitty gritty, the politics of reason and science. For that dance is the most beautiful dance of all. Thank you very much.
see it. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just want to ask you to clarify what you were saying. You mentioned two giants of morality, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Uh, both of them were very religious men. In fact, Martin Luther King was referred to as Reverend Ron, yeah. uh, Martin Luther King. Very powerful men, very womanizers as well. Yeah. This is documented. I'm asking you, does your parents' morality different from yours? Is your morality different from mine? Or does womanizing doesn't count? Well, let me, uh, let me address that. Um, first of all, uh, well, uh, a few things. One is uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, um, not a perfect person, a religious person, uh, was a very secular person in terms of his policies. Uh, so I'll address that aspect first. Uh, when the Supreme Court ruling came out in 1962 uh, about getting government enforced prayer into uh, American public schools, uh, President Kennedy responded uh, by saying, well, if you want to pray, you can pray on weekends. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King uh, responded by saying uh, he supported the ruling, and then furthermore, that he felt uh, even more convinced that he was right to support the ruling uh, when he saw that the racist Alabama governor, George Wallace, was so opposed uh, to the ruling of the Supreme Court getting government orchestrated prayer out of school. So, Dr. King was a religious man. Uh, President Kennedy, I'm not so sure, he went to Mass every uh, Sunday, maybe because of what happened on Saturday night, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but, nonetheless, they were very clear and kept to their pledge to separate church and state in government, and I think that is noble, uh, commendable, and I commend them uh, for that leadership. Uh, I do want to correct you on one historical point. Uh, you're, I think you might be thinking of John Kennedy. Robert Kennedy, there is not really a historical record of, of Robert Kennedy being a, a womanizer. President Kennedy, well documented indeed. The uh, Reverend Dr. King, no question, also a womanizer. Uh, my thinking on that is in terms of your public versus private morality, uh, I have a different view. I write a chapter in my book about sexual morality, and I think the right answer for me is uh, consenting adults. I can't speak for what Dr. King or President Kennedy uh, would have said had they ever been you know, faced with those kinds of questions. But for me, the issue is whether people are consenting adults and whether they are honest with one another about those issues. And I write about that in chapter four of my book and I encourage you to check it out. Because I think and I hope that maybe we share the same values in that respect. I don't know what it was like though uh, to be alive in their time and in their place. Uh, and so I, I feel a little uncomfortable uh, you know, making a final judgment on what that world was like. But I do think that their policy stands are ones which are hugely ennobling, and whatever faults that we want to attribute to them, I still think that I'd rather have them uh, leading us into a uh, nation with separated church and state than what we saw from George W. Bush. Uh, Graham Hacken, uh, first of all, where the hell do you get to learn to talk like that? <laughs> um, second, um, Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister of Australia, is publicly known as an atheist, yep. and as such, she got elected as leader of the party, and as leader of the party, got elected as Prime Minister of Australia. Yep. Do you see that as um, a, a good thing as far as uh, a, a voice against the undercurrents of fundamentalists? And fundamentalism in Australia, or is she just the voice of the wilderness? Thank you. Well, um, I don't claim to be an expert on Australian politics, but I guess just briefly let me talk about the yin and the yang and the positive and the negative. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Prime Minister Gillard, who does identify, I don't know if she said the word atheist, but not religious certainly, uh, unfortunately she's not been as strong as we would hope in terms of some of these issues that I just raised about funding for religious schools. In fact, she's actually supported some increases, so it's been disappointing. And it really goes against the heritage of the country, and now, because of some of the internal scrambling there, uh, Tony Abbott's the man's name, uh, they're talking that he might win for prime ministership down there uh, coming uh, in September. I hope they rejuvenate in Australia their founding heritage. The first poem probably written about the founding of Australia was by um, Charles Darwin's grandfather, and it talked about labor and hope and set out all these secular values in a poem for the founding of Australia. And she's not even, uh, Prime Minister Gillard is not even the first uh, 
prime minister who is not religious, Bob Hawke, for those who are history fans, Bob Hawke uh, said right back in the 80s when he was prime minister that he wasn't religious. And also, when he was a, a, a scholar at Oxford, he set the world record for drinking a pint. So <laughs> awesome uh, heritage that they have in Australia. And uh, I hope that they rejuvenate that, because I worry, and, and it's sort of an overall message from the first half of my talk anyway, is that uh, I think there's a tendency within some of these Commonwealth countries where they say, ah, we're never going to be as crazy as America, so let's just rest and sit back. And I really think that is, is a danger. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very grateful. That, my name is John Ryan. I'm from Winnipeg. I'm very grateful that you and the previous speaker brought attention to uh, the fact that Stephen Harper and the Conservatives are this reactionary uh, policy. But are you aware that they were elected by a minority of the Canadian people. The majority had their votes split among three parties, and are you aware that the only way that we could ever get rid of the Harperites is if the Conservatives, NDP, and the Greens form a coalition? Without that, we'll live forever with Harperites. Your knowledge is probably good. My name is George Feenstra. I'm a resident of the city of Kamloops. I have friends in the room. I'm very, very grateful for the things that you've said today. Others here will know that it can be very, very lonely to be a free thinker in a society that purports itself to be free. One time I stood in front of a small group of people at a small elementary school at a protest and I said to them, on the basis of my observations of what I call boundary issues, I am going to be arrested before your eyes. I'm going to, let, I'm going to walk in like this, they're going to take this end, they're going to take this end, they're going to go like this, they're going to go like this, assault one, assault two. So I demonstrated that my research was accurate. I went up to the line with the two policemen where they did exactly as I predicted, and they dragged me off to the Vancouver City Jail, where they proceeded to strip me naked, bend me over, and ritually sodomize me. This was tried in a court of law in the province of British Columbia, in the nation of Canada, under a motto that said, God is our right. I, yeah, I wasn't sure about the beginning or the... All I'm sorry, I'm very sorry I to say, I just wanted to thank you so very much for saying the things that you said. And thank you, thank you for allowing me to say them. <laughs> thank you, um, one of the greatest advantages that I see that the religious right has is the psychology of uh, terror theory, and it's actually a, uh, an area of psychology, terror theory, the fear of hell. Um, you said that, you know, we can lobby and do just as much. How do you overcome that? Well, uh, I think, and I will go back to, uh, and, and this, I've never seen someone raise that about Dr. King, so it's interesting. It's true, you know, the guy had his faults. But I think that when you organize for a cause, uh, a justice cause, and this kind of goes to Peter's, I think, excellent talk yesterday. Remember when Peter was talking about um, you're sitting next to the person on the airplane, and maybe with that person, you don't want to bring up things like morality or politics. And I think he's probably right. I thought that was a great presentation. But when you're talking about the public policy realm, when you're talking about persuading masses of people on television and, and elsewhere, uh, I think that in some ways you're thinking about a, a, a third audience, not so much the committed fundamentalists, though often on the Dawkins Facebook page I see people who are thoroughly persuaded by hardcore arguments by Aaron and so many others who make those kind of arguments, so that works. Um, they're coming from fundamentalism to a secular viewpoint. But to, to have mass change, it's, it's my thesis that uh, what we want to be is the leaders of a justice movement. And then for all the terror, and I acknowledge it, I, I, I did not grow up in a religious home, and I've never experienced it, and I feel bad for people who have that you know, terror of hell. I never went through that. Man, I know how serious it is. But I think for the mass of citizens, that when they get convinced that they are participating in a justice movement, that they are doing something that's bettering humanity and, and, and really ennobling themselves, that that is not only the right thing to do, it's also the best political strategy. And that's what I think we can be the leaders of in this century. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name 
Sean Fairbeck. I'm with uh, the CFI in Calgary. And, uh, I, I guess a question: When you started off, you mentioned about the, the increase in the religious right in, in the United States, particularly from around the, the 60s and 70s. We're also seeing uh, uh, an increase in those uh, both in Canada and in the United States that are identifying as being non-religious. Yep. Uh, do you see these as two independently rising areas? Um, are we going to see a polarization? And I guess what would be your forecast for the next 30 years? I, I'm very. Uh, I, I'm not much of a you know weatherman. But, uh, it, I'll, I'll say I know which way the wind blows, as Mr. Dillon uh, would say. And what I think is is that uh, things are headed our way. I am really optimistic. I write about this in a chapter of my book that when you look at the religious right in uh, the United States, anyway, uh, they did well. They were growing from about 70 to 1990. But actually, despite perceptions. From about 1990, fundamentalist right in America has kind of plateaued. They haven't necessarily lost so much, but they haven't gained a lot either. They've kind of stayed in the same position. Meanwhile, secular people have grown dramatically, no doubt about it, especially among young people. I'm really excited and optimistic, and I frankly think that trend is going to continue because that generation, you know, the ones who were parent, you know, or kids in the 90s are now getting where they're going to be raising kids, and a higher percentage of them are secular. And I think it's beautiful. It's let freedom ring. And a lot of kids today, a higher percentage of children are going to grow up in, with parents who care about them and love them and don't happen to participate in religion. And I think that's all to the good for this upcoming generation of children. And I think that that bodes well for us politically. I saw this in in office. In Maine, we do it the old-fashioned way. We go door to door, knock on the door, and ask for a vote. So I'd knock on Stephen King's door back in my hometown in Bangor, Maine, and ask him for his vote. Got it, by the way. <laughs> but then, but then uh, I'd go to every door in the trailer park, you know, and meet everybody and ask for their votes as well. And meanwhile, I'd campaign, me, you know, I'd campaign Sunday morning. And um, I saw during 10 years, I literally could observe on my own this demographic trend where uh, the, like the beautiful, we had a beautiful Catholic church, really nice architecture, lovely building, fewer and fewer people in it the Episcopal Church, fewer and fewer people in it. Uh, but when you, the megachurch sort of maintained, they kept their own. Uh, but overall, the big growth was the people from what I'll call the old main line, the liberal churches, they're doing the garden, digging the weeds on Sunday morning, they're not going to church anymore. And then they're building that next generation. So I think it's tremendously positive, but it won't work. It won't work unless we do things like this brief documentary. There's one thing I can emphasize to you folks. It's that we really, really need to say we're going to, just like there's an ACLU in every state in America, in every province in Canada, have a convention. So people go, oh, there's a convention of this, and they're talking about these issues. And you don't need to wait for you know, a, a Daniel Dennett or a Richard Dawkins. You can build that your own, your local base. Thank you. My name is Linda Helford. I'm from Vancouver. And I heard one of the parts of your speech, which was great, by the way. You talked about the blogger in Pakistan who was hacked to death. Are you familiar with the Facebook page, Atheist Republic? Yes. Uh, some. I mean, I follow a lot of them, but yeah. It started by a young Iranian man in Vancouver from a Muslim family. Oh, great. He opened the page, and three months after it opened, he had 600,000 mostly Muslim people from Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Morocco, um, Bangladesh, and off he had to create a private page with less, there's about 10,000, and often on there, some of the entries are from kids in these countries saying, I gotta get out of here, I think they found my posts. And he's amazingly brave, it's Atheist Republic, he's starting a website, Atheist Republic, and his work, he's doing it all on his own, and he said to me the other day, he's very sad, he don't think, he doesn't think he can ever go back to Iran now and see his family. Well, thank you for that, and I encourage people to communicate with uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation, with me. I mean, it's kind of a fire hose of information. I'm not exaggerating in terms of, you know, there's a couple hundred thousand people a week who comment on that page, and then there's people who try to contact us directly, and it's kind of hard to triage through that number of contacts, but especially in the, uh, you know, the, the Muslim world. And again, there are wonderful amounts, I want to be clear, because of yesterday's discussion, and, you know, the vast majority of Muslim people are not engaging in terrorism and so forth and so on. But the reality is millions of people are subject to terror because of an Islamic viewpoint and we need to help those people. Thank you very much for your speech.
speech today. Um, I want to preface this with, you know, we are from very similar countries. You have freedom from religion. It's, it's tried in your constitution. We do not. Yes. Um, I went to a Catholic. You took. You spoke with uh, government-funded schools. Yeah. A little bit. And I went to a Catholic school here in BC. Now, it's baked into our constitution for certain provinces that there be Catholic Catholic schools. Yes. And there's no politician today. You know, maybe 20 years from now. There's no, no politician today that's going to, to say, we're going to stop funding schools, sorry, you've got a tithe more, right? right? So what is it going to take for that to happen? Does it just need to be a large portion of the population or what? I, I, I would, you know your politics better than I do, but my guess is you're right that that's not going to change tomorrow, but that doesn't mean you don't start raising the issue and bringing it up. And I would try to look for specific examples. When I was down in Australia and New Zealand, we would get specific examples like that. That story I told was was correct about these kids in New Zealand who, you know, they were either some minority religion or they weren't religious, and they were sent to the naughty corner to go pick up trash while the other kids were in religious instruction by a fundamentalist uh, who did not even represent the majority view of Christians. But I think those kinds of uh, anecdotes are good. I know within the world of, of atheism and science and reason it's sometimes looked down upon to uh, offer anecdotes. I love anecdotes. I think that they are the door opening. As long as you're telling the truth, as long as you're supporting it with the major truth, then I think anecdotes are critically important. Start telling those stories, start advocating about the issue, and maybe some of the young people in this room are elected to office Maybe some of the other folks in this room are running for school boards and starting to address these issues. I would not say, because I often hear that mindset, well, because it's not possible today, it won't be possible tomorrow. When I was a young, you know, pup out of law school or what have you, I remember I became legal counsel to the state senate, and you know, I was, I'm a Democrat, and uh, even with the Democrats, uh, when the gay uh, community folks, uh, LGBT folks, would come, they, Democrats would talk and be like, "Hello, the gay." <laughs> you know, at the same time, whereas the Republican, of course, it wasn't even happening with the Republicans at that time, they weren't even going to talk to them. And, but they kept showing up. You know, it's kind of like Woody Allen, you know, said 90% of success is showing up. And they kept showing up, and they were in the coalition meetings, and the progressive meetings. And yeah, at first they were viewed as these fringy people, whatever, but they politely showed up and participated. And each time there was a vote on, you know, forget marriage, I'm talking about here where it was just not discrimination or not fire someone from a job for being gay, something like that. And um, the vote would go up and up and up and eventually it succeeded. It took years. And I just hope that we have the fortitude uh, to do that. I mean, you know, back uh, with, with uh, Dr. King, I mean, there was a whole uh, many decades of planning before he gave that I have a dream speech. And I think that uh, we need to be involved in that many decades of planning and I'm eager to work with you on it. Hi, I'm Marilee from Vancouver, and I was just wondering what you thought about um, organizing with liberal and uh, left uh, religious groups or individuals, and when you, if, like, if you do think it's ever okay, when you know if you're being an accommodationist or not. Um, I, th I uh, believe strongly we should organize with liberal religious uh, people. I think it's a great thing to do, uh, particularly on public policy causes. And by the way, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop uh, uh, proselytizing, if you will, uh, because uh, if I'm sitting in, in the airplane with a Lutheran, I'm not offended if the Lutheran, you know, a liberal Lutheran says to me, well, I believe in the Lutheran church and here's my reasons. That's totally fine. I think they should be able to do that any day of the week or the most extreme fundamentalist, whether they're, you know, a fundamentalist Muslim or a fundamentalist Protestant, they have that right. Absolutely. But I have the right to say, you know what, I don't believe in God. Here's my reasons. I hope you'll come with me. So I'll pr proselytize every day of the week about that. However, when it comes to policy, public policy, Unitarian, Universalist, United Church of Christ, and the list goes on and on, you know, most of the Jewish congregations, not all, uh, are on board with us from the get-go. And I say we make alliances with them and work on public policy uh, to beat the band. And I guess that's the last question. Thank you so much.